Good evening, dear guests and friends of American University Kyiv. Welcome to the IUK Talks. This IUK Talk is special because we're trying um, to open new format of event for us when some of them will be conducted not just IUK Talk team members, but by master students of the university. And I'm honored to be the first one who start uh, this tradition and start this new format of IUK Talk. Um, my name is Rosson Wudnikov. I am Chief Marketing Officer at Navi. It's one of the biggest esports club um, globally. And my my passion is all about marketing and communication. So during the last 12 years, I observed everything about communication and marketing. And um, let me introduce our speakers today. It's Yuri Boykiv and Christopher Skinner. Uh, Yuri Boykiv is CEO and board member of Rontro. He previously served as the president of Dance X, a global media agency. And uh, during this work, he, he worked with prestigious clients like LVMH, Jagger, and Went Rover, Hitachi, Appealed, and like other. Before it, Yuri co founded Gravity Media. It's a multicultural advertising agency with offices in New York, Los Angeles, and London. Gravity Media experienced exponential growth and gained recognition as one of American faster growing companies. Yuri holds an MBA from Pace University, and he also earned, owned a presidential um, management degree from the Harvard Business School. Yuri always supports Ukraine during the, this tough time and originally Yuri from Berezhani, Ternopil region. And also he's regularly contributed financially to his native school in Berezhani in, in, in Ternopil region where almost other things, he established a scholarship for talented students. And that's the way he helps more than 200 students. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, Christopher Skinner. Christopher is co-founder and CEO of School of House, the creative agency that has now become a part of Front Row. School House specialized in branding strategy, engaging creative, immersive environment, and um, engaging content for the most uh, world known in demand beauty brands. So uh, Christopher led through leadership and creative direction across all school house and school houses studios disciplines including like new brand creation brand re recreation retail concepts and design thank you boss uh, for being with us today and i would like to ask you to tell more about the front row about the agency and about the project that you focus is now awesome thank you ruslan it's a pleasure to be here um i think christopher and i <clears throat> Uh, super excited to be here with the students, with all of you. Um, as someone who comes from Ukraine, I'm always happy to help. And uh, when this opportunity came, I thought it would be really good to bring uh, my friend and colleague, Chris, who has been a huge contributor to our growth, but also who has an incredible story to tell. Um, and I think Chris will talk for himself, but we have like a short presentation just to tell you about our company a little bit, and then we could open for questions. Yes, thank you, Yuri, and thank you all for having me here. It's such a pleasure um, and for that wonderful introduction. Um, just a little bit about my story. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, we are all comprised of our experiences, and that's really what sets us apart in our ability to tackle the day to day and our present circumstances professionally and personally. My story really starts um, when I was quite young. My mother is a lawyer, and she was the first graduating female class of the United States. My father is a writer, um, and you know this in the '80s in Texas, which is where I'm from, was very uh, different uh, for uh, an American family. And that upbringing really instilled in me an appreciation for both art and commerce. Um, and it's why I live and work in a space that I can be creative, but I can also be strategic. Um, my career uh, was, was beautifully outlined, uh, but I represent a more unorthodox way of getting to a place of um, you know, success. 
I am much more street smart. I have grit. I have passion. I have determination. Um, I went to college and I, I left early. Not that I am saying anyone should do that. Um, but for me, all, all of the, the success that, that I've had really has been on the ground, um, learning from customers and working my way up uh, the corporate ladder over two decades specific to beauty. And, um, and so, you know, I'm really here to, to share and show what I believe brand and creative can do for e-commerce and a perfect complement to Yuri's experience and background, um, but also a representation that every path is unique and your path is unique. Um, and really, if you draw, if you believe and you follow what you are passionate about and what brings you joy, everything else works out and you will find that success that feels right for you. So that is really my personal story to parallel the professional one shared. And Yuri, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your personal story that, that got you here today. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a, a little bit different story than Chris, but also comes from a similar, similar humble beginning. Uh, I was born in Ukraine, like most of you guys, and uh, in, in the west part of Ukraine, in, in, in Ternopil Oblast. And um, um, my parents moved to Poland in the 90s, and I moved to um, Poland with my mom in 1999 and my sister. And then in 2001, I went to the United States as a tourist. Um, I was in college in Poland at the time. Um, there was a summer of 20, 2001. And then, unfortunately, uh, September 11 happened, which was the, one of the most difficult terrorist attacks on the U.S. soil. Um, I couldn't go back to Poland to continue my education because no airline was flying back. So I was kind of stuck in the U S and, um, I transferred my credits from Polish school, from Polish university to Berkeley college of New York. Um, and that's where my, how my immigrant story started in the U S in 2001. Um, so 23 years later, I went through, I finished my bachelor degree. I got my first job there. I finished my MBA degree. I got married, had two kids. Um, and then eventually, as uh, I started my own company in 2009, I grew that company uh, to from New York to LA and London, as Ruslan mentioned. And I sold that company in 2016 to Dentsu, which is a large holding company, Japanese holding company uh, that's publicly traded. And I spent four and a half years at Dentsu um, after selling the business. So, um, that was my sort of immigrant story. I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs, but what I learned the most is to stay humble and stay true to where you come from and help people as much as you can because karma is a real thing. Beautiful. I love that. And Yuri, just um, I think before we hop into front row and our sort of complementary perspective on brand and e-commerce, maybe let's start with the landscape of both you know, leading with e-commerce. I think what's important when we think about brand and e-commerce um, is that they really work together ultimately. Um, and the more that they are integrated with one another, the stronger that they are. And so front row, as you'll see in our capabilities and our work um, really is set up to pay off both um, because we believe as you grow brand, you're able to grow e-commerce. So Yuri, I think we lost you, but uh, maybe with that setup, you can share a little bit about from an e-commerce landscape, what's happening. Totally. Um, thank you for picking up for me as always. <laughs> uh, the world of e-commerce is interesting because it's it's a relatively new thing. So, so the way we think about commerce is any kind of retail sales that's happening around the world, um, mostly in stores. But e-commerce has started growing significantly in the last 20 years and hit 3.5 trillion uh, uh, in the last couple of years. I think that the growth of e-commerce is what's really dominating the headlines. Importance of marketplaces such as Amazon uh, and recently TikTok shop have really um, helped uh, people to start talking about e-commerce more seriously. Um, I think that um, as of today, I believe as of today, 14% of all global trade is happening through a digital device. Um, the Boston Consulting Group study shows that close to 50 or 60% of all the global 
commerce, any kind of purchase in the world in about 10 to 15 years will be initiated on the device. Nobody knows how the delivery will happen and where you pick up your products, but the initiation of the commerce of, of, of your purchase will start on the device, which is a really important um, point because as you're thinking about growth of um, global businesses, ability to sell online and ability to deliver the products on time and meet customer expectations will become paramount for most of the brands, no matter where you are, whether you're in Kiev or you're in New York. Um, the other important part to mention is that about 86% of consumers utilize multiple channels for purchasing. Where back in the days, customers only had one choice, go to a store and buy something. Now they have a choice, go to a store to buy something, go to a supermarket to buy something, buy it on a company website, which is called DTC or direct to consumer, or buy it on a marketplace such as Amazon, where you have a variety of different uh, brands represented. Um, so most consumers as of today are buying in a variety of different stores. They're not tied to one channel. Um, and it's also important to mention that a lot of clients used to think single channels and they would dedicate marketing people per channel saying like you, John, responsible for direct to consumer, you, Sally, responsible for retail and you, Christopher, responsible for marketplaces. Right now, they merge in those roles into one holistic commerce role. And that opens up a lot of opportunities for data synergies, for uh, cross-channel marketing, for cross-channel communication, because that's how consumers behave. They buy at different channels at different times of the day. Third-party marketplaces, which uh, uh, Amazon is a part of it, are dominating that e-commerce world. I mean, Amazon has made a living as well as Alibaba in China and, and, and a lot of other play, major players around the world of being that convenience choice uh, for consumers around the world to buy products. I, I know Amazon is not maybe that popular in, uh, in Ukraine, but it is a dominant player almost everywhere globally, especially in the U.S., and within Amazon, you have two systems, how e-commerce works. One is Amazon itself buys products directly from a brand and sells it on Amazon.com. So let's say Amazon would go to a P&G, buy the diapers and sell it on Amazon.com. That's called 1P. 3P sell segment, which is about more than half of Amazon business, is Amazon as a marketplace opens its facilities, opens its distribution, opens up its marketing opportunity for third-party sellers so anybody can sell products on their platform without Amazon ever buying them. So essentially, if I want to sell a cell phone, I don't want to sell it to Amazon, but I want to sell it to a consumer, I can utilize Amazon platform to sell it directly to the customers. And that is the dominant player as of today, and that is where most of our business is based as from Pro. And the last point is that digital advertising is growing. More than half of the advertising in the world is now digital. And I think Ruslan knows it better than anybody working in the digital marketing world. But generally, the digital will continue dominating um, and stealing market share from traditional players like TV, out of home, and print. And to piggyback on that, really because of this continuously you know, changing, complex space, the importance of brand is ever more important today um, because really to dominate within these varieties of channels and platforms and advertising messages and outlets, um, you really have to build a strong foundation onto which everything starts to cascade from. And ultimately what that does is it one, you know, really allows you to have an ownable distinctive identity that sets you apart in this crowded marketplace and e-commerce space that really enhances recognition and recall. There's sort of two building blocks to that that I always talk about. There's sort of a brand DNA. So what are three to four things that are inherently and ownable to you, authentically to you? Um, and then what are your brand codes? those things that are used in bold consistency for recognition. There's a, reason, there's a reason why Tiffany is known for its blue and continues to double down that on that and use it through packaging, print, digital advertising, retail design, shop and shop design, travel retail. It's because it builds recognition. 
And that allows you to continuously cut through and start to own a place in the mind of the consumer as it relates to that category. And in doing that in consistency, you build trust. And that is really, really important when we get consumers down the conversion funnel, you know, they start to be critical of, is this a brand that is reliable? Is this product of quality? Um, and, and, and those are deciding factors that we sort of put a lot of time into as it relates to product detail pages on Amazon marketplaces or on D2C um, owned e-commerce sites, because those things build trust. <clears throat> and, and ultimately, as you're sort of creating that brand and you're, ide you're identifying what you want to own, how you want to be memorable, and where you need to play consistently, you automatically start having marketing impact because you're, you, it's like a snowball effect. Um, you you want to keep the snowball rolling and growing. And every time you change message or you change look, you're back at the top of the mountain with a small snowball to begin with. And so you need to maintain that consistency to build memorability. And ultimately, when you convert and you build that recognition and that trust, you naturally have loyalty. And loyalty is great, advocacy is better. And that really means I'm buying and I'm coming back and I'm buying again, but I'm also sharing. And I'm sharing with my closest friends, I'm sharing with my family, and I'm an advocate now on behalf of you and your brand. And ultimately that really increases your ROI on any marketing spend. Referral and word of mouth is still one of the most powerful things that a brand can start to build um, in its overall salience. And so these things really come together underneath front row and were really built to establish those brand building roots to amplify e-commerce presence. And Yuri, I think it'd be great for you to build on that. And we can now introduce sort of how does Front Row catalyze this? Sounds good. So very quickly, we position ourselves as a commerce catalyst and we mostly focus on three, four verticals. It's beauty, wellness, and consumer brands. Um, and we leverage our capabilities and pr proprietary technology called Catapult to design, market, distribute, and accelerate brands on a global scale. We usually help brands everything from strategy to creative to content development. And then in some cases, we become exclusive distributor of those brands on 3P marketplaces. And sometimes we just help them market themselves through a variety of e-commerce channels. Um, this is a holistic view of our capabilities um, from strategy and design where we help brands package or envision its look and feel. And Chris plays a big part in that, in, in, in that, on that journey with the brands where we sometimes create complete uh, uh, packaging or the way the brand will come to market. We, re we imagine those brands from scratch. And then sometimes we work on the content creation, usually, usually using social media and social channels digital marketing, both B2C and B2B, and then e-commerce management, marketplace, and business intelligence through insights and analytics. And kind of building on that, um, you know, we think about our, our group sort of broken into that agency side that's all around that brand building, you know, route, and then our marketplace where we're amplifying that you know, through e-commerce and, and pushing individuals down the conversion funnel to, to really drive sales, to drive you know, real e-commerce growth. And so what we thought would be helpful is really demonstrating a little bit about you know, digging deeper into that, what does that really mean? And so to reiterate what Yuri was sharing, from an agency side, we have sort of four key capabilities, strategy design, content, consumer digital marketing, and B2B digital marketing. And ultimately, these capabilities are really centered around the consumer. You know, we are consumer obsessed digital makers with a creative soul. And we're storytellers at the end of the day. And our job is to tell the most ownable and uh, an authentic story so that it can really become legacy. And, and that is what, you know, most brands are really after. We don't want to be, you know, a three to five year business. We want to build legacy for all those involved um, and key shareholders. And so how do we do that? 
you know, we start to, you know, look at this through five different key verticals of, of roots. Um, the first is just brand development. Um, and as Yuri was sharing, sometimes this is brand creation where we're working with founders or an executive team, really taking a seedling of an idea and bringing that to life in full dimension. And that really means positioning in a market, our strategy, our key messaging and our visual look and feel. We then bring that to life through product and packaging, which is ultimately one of the most powerful touch points that a brand can have and one of its most important. Uh, because if you think about virtual shelf and physical shelf, packaging is really the driving story, uh, the story machine to everything to create intrigue, to convert, uh, et cetera. And there's different things that you want to have involved depending upon the category. And then as brands begin to grow, we ensure that their story is consistent through retail and merchandising. How do I show up in travel retail? How do I show up as a shop and shop inside, inside, of, inside of a large department store? How do I show up in a specialty space? And again, we have to be creating that through line so that as I think about a brand and I recognize its packaging, naturally its retail design is paying off a lot of that work. Campaign and content is important. Content is really a, the connector between strategy and execution and advertising and conversion. You know, a, a strategic deck is only as good as it is executed and content is really most important to execute that. And there's a variety of content that we build for brands, either at that campaign awareness level or all the way down into conversion. And as we think about this through the lens of different channels and platforms, what we mean when we say content changes. And then lastly, 360 integrated global marketing. You know, this is really going after and acquiring new consumers through awareness campaigns and tactics or retaining existing consumers and building that loyalty through retention uh, tactics. And so this really provides an end to end that sets us up to propel that e-commerce growth and nurture those opportunities with our marketplace uh, partner teams. And as, as was mentioned at the beginning, we've done this for the leading brands, um, you know, particular to beauty, health, wellness, and consumer packaged goods. And we work with brands on incubation, on evolution, and those large brands that most likely are standing out to you, Clinique, Estee Lauder, MAC, La Mer. These are global brands where we're not just sort of overhauling a brand, but these become more regional specific or channel specific projects. And we brought one um, to sort of demonstrate the way that we think. Um, Dr. Dennis Gross Skincare is just kind of like breaking into Europe over the last three years. So it might be a brand you're familiar with or unfamiliar with, but hopefully um, seeing soon. Uh, but ultimately, this is a 25-year-old brand started by Dr. Dennis Gross, a practicing and formulating dermatologist, and his wife, who was um, uh, acting CEO, most recently acquired by Shiseido Group uh, at the end of last year. But our work began 10 years ago because they have an iconic single skew called the Alpha Beta Peel. The daily peel, if anyone in the audience is suffering from texture skin challenges or acne or extraneous oil, this is a product that really is per particular to you um, and what the brand is really known for. However, what we were concerned of 10 years ago was that this was really a commodity product, right? How do we build a brand and loyalty and all of those things that I was mentioning at the beginning around a single skew? so that someone doesn't just come in with a better version of it and then the brand is left nowhere. And so we really built this brand around the fact that Dennis is one of the few practicing and formulating dermatologists. He's seeing patients every day in his practice um, and they're coming in and based on how they talk about skin, tells him what they're thinking about and he starts to then formulate. And I'll give you one last example and pass it to Yuri, but uh, Dennis came to us once uh, as it related to a new product launch. And he said, you know, for the first time, I have consumers and clients coming into my practice saying they have tired skin. And he was like, I've never heard people sort of describe their skin as tired. Generally, it's more functional. Um, and so he turned to vitamin C. Vitamin C is a, 
uh, has a molecular component that when it engages other cells and skin, it energizes them. So it boosts their capability to perform better. And then that insight created that product. And then our, our overall campaign tagline was turn your skin on. And so it's a way of demonstrating that building a brand position and a strategy doesn't mean we walk away from it. It's mean, it means that we always are inspired by it and we pull it through every single touch point. And that really is what creates that big brand um, effect and allows brands to capture uh, more consumers. And so that, that brand building route really sets up all of our marketplace capabilities where we're building that presence and amplification. And Yuri's going to share a little bit more about what we do there. Great. Thank you, Chris. So um, just to quickly explain to you what happens after the brand is created or the campaign is created, then we take it all the way through the e-commerce lens and we start implementing different uh, strategies uh, to make sure that the brand is selling and on as many places as possible around the world. Next slide. Um, I'll just give you one example uh, um, uh, later, but generally what we do is we help um, accelerate brands growth in a variety of marketplaces. A lot of our work is done on Amazon um, because that's one of the largest marketplaces in the world. And so what we do, we help brands create the presence on Amazon. Um, we then create a marketing campaign to drive performance of the brand on, on a particular marketplace. But also what's equally important, um, we help the brand with the logistics, optimization, brand health, customer response, holistic offering for uh, for the company. So if you are a brand who wants to launch in, a, in different marketplaces, I mean, this one is for Amazon, Walmart, and TikTok, we essentially uh, buy your products at the wholesale price um, and then exclusively sell them on a variety of marketplaces, performing all types of services inclusive of uh, logistics and uh, and operations. And then we use a platform called Catapult. It's a technology we built internally that helps us optimize uh, uh, our performance on marketplaces. Uh, we also started implementing some of the AI technology to help us optimize listings and also uh, improve uh, our logistics across, across the entire ecosystem. And then we work with some of the most important brands. I mean, anything from Unilever to P&G, uh, to some of the so up and coming brands like Glow Recipe and Summer Fridays, um, but the, the the market is expanding. As of today, we have over four hundred brands that we are working with globally. So one quick example: there is a brand that we launched called Glow Recipe. Uh, they came to us um, uh, when they were doing about one to two million dollars on Amazon. They had a lot of illegal resellers who were buying the same products somewhere in the store and reselling it on Amazon. And they said, look, we have a big issue. We are not really growing there. So what we did for them, we recreated their brand completely on Amazon, the way it looks, the way it feels. Uh, we performed all types of logistic operations and optimizations for them. We went after those illegal resellers. We have the whole legal team that's just dedicated to illegal reseller enforcement. Um, and then we started using some of the best in class marketing to drive their sales. Uh, we went from 2 million in sales when they came to us four years ago to 15 million in sales last year. And this year we're planning to do about 26 million in sales for Glow Recipe on Amazon.com. So that's just a, a great success story for us. And that's it about us. I know it was a quick 30 minutes. I mean, there's millions of things we can talk about, but we thought it would be a good setup for any kind of Q&A that Ruslan wants to do. Yeah, yeah. Yuri, Christopher, thank you for sharing such great your experience and uh, this presentation. Please, uh, our guests, you could write a question in the chat and maybe I will start with some questions that I have, especially like during your presentation. You know, uh, I could also, first I could emphasize that you talk a lot about brand, about storytelling, about content, and it's it's not very common things when, when people talk about e-commerce because, because when people talk about e-commerce, the first they mentioned about some performance funnel, conversion funnels, I don't know, some metrics like CPA, cost per lead. They say, okay, uh, how you could bring me like cheaper client, cheaper leads and so on. And now you, you say more about content, about brand, about trust and so on. Uh, 
looking to your experience, how is it, is it the, like the easiest way to find this balance between brand, brand platform and brand positioning and performance tools? So I think, you know, um, when we think about performance tools and branding, ultimately these are not opposing forces, right? These are complementary elements that when aligned, you know, really drive overall effectiveness of your e-commerce strategy and execution. Um, so it's it's really about finding that right, right balance between brand platform, brand positioning, and and tools to really ensure that we are converting loyalists and converting sales at every aspect of that journey. And so while conversion tools are essential for you know, driving immediate sales, a, long, a strong brand platform ensures long-term loyalty and trust. And so for instance, like leveraging branded content within conversion-focused campaigns, it can ultimately really improve engagement and conversion rates by providing a more cohesive and memorable customer experience. So the best way to sort of visualize it is brand is this is this line. It's this arrow that's always moving forward and ever continuing. And then conversion tools, which are constantly changing, right? I mean, that's that's the nature of e-commerce and that landscape are the things that sort of fall out of that. Um, but we never want to stop short because they sort of grow one another. Yuri, I don't know if there's anything you want to yeah, add. I just want to that. add that because a lot of work that we do is on Amazon. Amazon has a lot of amazing media tools to optimize campaigns. And and we do we use metrics like ROAS or tacos, like return on advertising spend or total advertising cost of sales. So we have all these metrics in place. We have technology and tools in place. And that plays a big role. But Amazon or any marketplace is a demand generating platform. So consumers still need to type something mm -hmm. into the search engine in order for them to find the products or listings. And I think that starts with brand awareness and brand, brand consideration. So if Chris and his team doesn't do a really good job on building brand awareness and brand consideration and images don't look amazing, people will not search for those products. And once they start searching for those products, demand improves, conversion improves. So that's how we start, we think about e-commerce and that's why this holistic view, in my opinion, is much more powerful. Mm -hmm. So first in e-commerce, e first you need to create demand and you need to create this trust and then to uh, help your consumer find your product in a any convenience way that they they yeah. could. Yeah. 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 And talking about creativity and storytelling, what kind of content, content format are crucial today for e-commerce strategy? I mean, I really think like, when we think about that, it, it's it's really all down to to really video, um, right? I mean, video content in particular, it really offers a dynamic way to convey a brand story, to convey its value. Um, there's in, there's incredible uh, innovation happening, particular to content quizzes, a lot of AR experiences. We're seeing obviously AI come in, particular to beauty, where we see you know, foundation matching, color matching, fragrance finders, skincare, you know, clues and, and quizzes. All of these things increase engagement and personalization, which makes your brand relatable. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, video is, is really a, a must have um, for that sort of standout power um, and to build that deeper connection. So you're really turning a passive viewer into an engaged potential customer. Mm -hmm. Christopher, you just mentioned about artificial intelligence and of course like artificial intelligence in, in data should power e-commerce like a lot at the time yeah, today and maybe you could tell us like about some more solutions that you use to help to simplify your analytical work like you shared about the business analytical tools and maybe something something more you could share it with us. Yeah, I can talk a little bit on it and then Yuri can expand it as well. Um, I mean, look, AI has really blown up over the last six to nine, you know, maybe arguably 12 months. And so, you know, really transparently, we are in the process of still really determining where and how to use it so that we are not, um, you know, replacing that kind of heart share work with an, with an AI tool. Where we have found it most uh capable, however, is really when it comes to optimizing content. So as we think about a brand, you know, we're really building a brand um, on, on the first part of our work, um, really in a silo, 
you know, what does this brand stand for? What's its DNA? What are its codes? And we're not really even thinking about execution. It's really just, can we start to build a heartbeat inside of an idea? And then when we, when we turn that into execution, um, I have really seen AI fantastic in terms of optimizing content specific to marketplaces. So, you know, within that, it's a really beautiful mix between really SEO rich content and brand content. And so AI, which prompt when prompted appropriately has an incredible way of, of fusing the two together. Um, similarly, so with visuals, though, I would say visual has a little bit further to go in terms of just the technological advancements. Um, and so from, from my world in terms of brand and creative, that's really where we've seen the tool most successful. Yuri, you might be able to speak to on other performance and, and measurement yeah. side. Yeah, I think that what Chris is talking about is like dynamic content optimization of like DCO. It's more of a machine learning where you take a concept and adapt it to a particular tactic uh, based on consumer responding to particular creative more than the other. And then the machine uses the idea, adapts the content to match the consumer screen. That's been happening for a while now and it's picking up speed more and more. Um, in terms of like pure, pure AI, it's still nowhere near it on the creative side. It's still kind of like a idea more than anything. Um, but from the uh, media side and optimization side, we use it a lot for search engine optimization um, and uh, content writing. So AI has been very successful in writing some of the listing pieces for Amazon or other, other marketplaces where you essentially set up the idea about the product and it searches and scrapes the web for pieces of content and creates the entire listing for, for the brand. And then obviously human goes in and, and optimizes it to make sure that it's readable. But the 90% the, the, the of the work is already done by the AI writer. Um, it's also used a lot in B2B marketing uh, where a lot of white papers, LinkedIn posts are written by AI and the, and, and the writer or the author just adds here and there. Um, so it speeds up time to market and the volume of content that's created. Um, in terms of the future, I think AI will have a, a, a profound impact on the marketing industry. I think a lot of content will be created leveraging AI. Uh, what will not be replaced is this, what Chris mentioned, the heart, the creativity part, the unpredictable mm -hmm. part of the human mind, uh, where the idea is created from scratch. I think that part is not still, I don't see AI replacing and then the last thing I'll say about AI is like you guys probably have seen, but YouTube started um, uh, demanding from uh, uh, anybody who's created AI generated content that it has to be labeled as AI generated on YouTube. So I think there'll be that distinction happening in the future. Mm -hmm. Like everyone brand should decide uh, would uh, would you would you love to just inform your users? Yeah, and that's you how you could use artificial intelligence just to distribute your content in different way or you want to surprise your audience if you want to surprise you need to show something new something fresh and for that you need to invest in creative in creative teams and no like in creative agency just to find the best on the market who could absorb all the trends and and create like unique creative yeah, it's amazing yeah. and you also um front row also has offices in the United States, Germany, and Slovakia. Yes, so in some way you see this holistic view, not just on one region or market, but different regions and different markets. And do you see any significant differences between e-commerce approach in the United States and in Europe? And if so, what exactly is this difference? Um, uh, uh, so we have four offices, two in the US, two in Europe. Um, the ones in Europe, we acquired those agencies. We didn't build them from scratch. We bought them. They, we have about 200 people in Europe. Um, I think the approach to e-commerce is kind of similar. I think the world is very global. I think it's very important for Ukraine and Ukrainians to understand that your skill sets that you develop in school, as well as your worldview and your beliefs, are very applicable around the world. So it's not like there is a very different approach to marketing or e-commerce in the US versus Morocco versus other places or Ukraine. I think what's important is um, experience in a particular market. And I think US is the biggest market. So ability to get experience in the US as a marketer 
will help you significantly if you want to work in the U.S. So I think that local experience matters a lot. Um, that's why we have uh, a German office, and Germany is one of the top e-commerce markets in Europe, an ability to understand how localization of content works, what are some of the nuances about e-commerce, is what is extremely important. But we started some of the functions as a sort of uh, a shared function. So for instance, a lot of our strategy is done in the US, but our execution of campaign management happens in Europe for global brands. So we started using some of those capabilities that are very unique to a, a particular office. Another example is in Germany, we have a very good analytics team. Um, and German market is, is is extremely multicultural. We have people from about 20 different nationalities working in our German office. And English is the common language, not German in our office. So uh, so we have incredible analysts in the German office that service our global clients, which I think is the way to also think about how do we leverage best in class from each country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of like building on that, I think, What's sort of interesting, I mean, from a brand perspective, obviously there's different, different wants and needs and desires from beauty, health and wellness brands. So as we think about the brand side, but, you know, from an e-commerce perspective, there's a lot of tactical things, you know, European strategies are more nuanced because there's like stricter data, uh, privacy regulations, um, more consent based approaches to marketing and data collections, um, uh, versus the U.S. that's more vast uh, and has a lot of, you know, diversity just within the sing singular country. But there's a broader range of like e-commerce tactics that really more focuses on scale and and um, innovation. So it, it it's it's interesting. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, we've been told like um, your Americans are just always quote unquote excited. So. Um, you know, from a working culture perspective, I'm, I'm very thankful that my mom is part German because it really helps translate and just getting work done in, a, in an effective manner as well. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions in our chat from our guests and our audience. So the first one is about audience. Um, which instruments do you use to study your clients' uh, needs and client customers, their needs, wants, lifestyle, and so on? And what is the future of digital market research? Mm. Um, so we have we have an entire insights team whose job is to drive insights from a variety of different sources. There are a lot of third-party tools that give us insights on consumer behavior, on... Um, uh, customer preferences. We look at probabilistic and deterministic data. Uh, we look at signals that consumers send by their purchase behavior online. But we also do studies where we actually find a third party research company if we want to study something very specific. Uh, the recent study I remember we 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 had was for PNG about Generation Alpha, which are people who are between ages of five and thirteen they become you know very active consumers of some of the beauty brands uh, if you walk into any beauty store most people who buy there are the 12 year olds with their moms so we wanted to understand how they think and what they believe and uh, what is the future of that generation how they're going to buy products differently from uh, people who are in their 20s and 30s so there's a variety of sources we use and i think there's a big uh, research is a big part of what Chris does, brand building, because it gives you an opportunity to understand uh, what consumers think and using those insights to build a brand. But it's also part of a media performance, like understanding what consumers buy in addition to your products. What are that, some of the competing brands? How consumers use the products, not only how they buy it, but how they use it helps us drive better marketing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how about consumers review you know like i'm a, like a marketing i always know that there is like some space for manipulation yeah how people can write review or how this review could like uh like appears in some platform but at the same time when i need to choose some product but i am not an expert i am going to check this review and go to check this comment and so on and how do you use this review on your job and how to drive people to leave some positive comments, to share their experience and to drive other people to, to buy this product? 
Um, I can talk from a very tactical perspective on the marketplace, and maybe Chris, you can talk about just generally how to how to make a person become a loyalist. Um, yeah. So from the more practical perspective, there are very strict rules and regulations on each marketplace uh, in terms of who can leave a review and what you can respond as a brand. So for instance, consumer reviews about delivery service are not allowed on Amazon. Like you can't just go under the brand listing and say, this particular diaper was not delivered on time. That's just banned. Um, but what you can say is like, I enjoyed this product or I didn't enjoy this product. I used it in this example. I didn't use it in that example. Um, so that is allowed. I think uh, what is also allowed from the brand perspective is to ask people to leave your review. What you cannot do, you cannot ask a person to leave a positive review. So that, that is a very important nuance. You want to be very objective. The other thing you cannot do, you cannot incentivize a person to leave a review in exchange for a coupon or a product. That's also banned on most marketplaces uh, globally. So the only thing you can do is make sure that you provide the best customer service, that you respond to people in a timely manner, that you return products if they're defective, if customers don't like them, and that you are true to your brand as well as you're true to your customer service. And I think if you're good with those things, you get your four or five star reviews. And uh, over time, you build the trust and loyalty on the marketplace. Yeah. And I think to kind of build to all of that, it's really the beginning, you know, foundation of, you know, who is the consumer that is in need of the service or product that I'm creating? And am I creating authentically the best version of that? Um, because ultimately, if you're trying to and you're targeting the wrong segmentation of consumer or the wrong consumer in totality, naturally, they're not going to be happy because it's not a real need or they won't see the value or they won't understand what quality looks like. So, you know, in that initial brand building, it's really about identifying our position and our customer. Um, and then all of the tactics that I mentioned before that really lead to a point where you're building loyalty that then get you to the point that Yuri shared where you're converting through customer service, um, et cetera. Uh, but we, outside of that, really our role is to um, manipulate without becoming hands-on. And, uh, and uh, there are other groups that are really more in that testimonial driving space, but really our role is to authentically build that connection. Mm -hmm. And talking about marketplace, uh, front row agency clients has around 95% market, percent marketplace client retention rate. Do you have any recommendation how Ukrainian company companies can achieve such retention rate working yeah. with their client? Yeah, so I think there are a few things that I've noticed working here. Uh, one is you over-communicate with your customers, with your clients. A lot of brands um, rely on you as a, as a distributor and marketer of their products. But I think over-communicating, building expectations up front, and proactively solving problems before they appear is, is what builds that loyalty between you and, and the client. The other thing is... Um, uh, over servicing, but in a way that creates value. It's not enough just to email and pitch new ideas, but showcase how these ideas will generate sales because in the end of the day, clients care about sales. So you need to be able to use analytics, best in class technology and creative to showcase and proof point how your idea generates sales. Um, and then um, I think always staying at the, at the top of innovation not waiting for things to happen and then presenting them to clients, but proactively showcasing them to them and explaining how a particular AI tool or a particular insight or a particular product can, can drive um, opportunity for the brand is, is what creates that loyalty and that retention, uh, uh, retention rate. I'll give you one example. Uh, we work with a beauty brand and we started noticing that consumers, when they add a particular product shampoo to the cart, they also add a conditioner from a competing brand. And we saw that uh, the reason they added the conditioner is because it was conditioner for men. And men were buying a shampoo that was more generic, but conditioner they wanted for men. And we went to client proactively saying, look, all you need to do, you don't have to recreate the product. All you need to do is just in your listing, change the fact that this particular conditioner is also for men. And then you will see the upstick in your sort of package deal uh, offers. Uh, and then we saw the significant addition of conditioner 
uh, to the to the shampoo where we started analyzing the data after after that recommendation. It was a simple ch change the client could make on the on the label that helped them increase their sales. So that proactivity helps build loyalty. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Yuri. Oh, Chris. Christopher, thank you for answering for the question in the chat while we're talking. And maybe last but not least question, um, how could Ukrainian company cooperate, could cooperate with front row? And in, 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 some, in, in what way? Chris, you want to start and I'll add? Yeah, so I mean, I think it really comes down to you know, value add. Uh, on, on our side, you know, we're continuously looking for um, you know, collaborators, we're very uh, flexible in terms of where these individuals sit. Um, so while we have four offices, not 100% of all of our team members are inside those four walls every single day. Um, and so I think it's really about building relationships and conversations. I mean, look, at the end of the day, like, we have a lot of probably future entrepreneurs on this call, we have a lot of self starting individuals, I'm a huge believer. If you want something, just go after it. Like don't ask and wait for permission. Um, and I can tell you as an entrepreneur myself who started with zero clients, um, you just reach out, build the connection and don't expect things to happen quickly. Think about things in terms of a long-term plan. You know, the seeds of a relationship get planted over many, many years sometimes. Um, and so if you are sitting here and you're saying, wow, I want to work with Chris and Yuri, then reach out to Chris and Yuri and talk to us about what you're doing and what you're interested in. Um, and I would say that for anything that you're doing within your own region, based upon your own skill set and with customers that you're after, um, you know, reach out, build that connection and make it authentic. No one wants a sales pitch, um, you know, really build an authentic connection um, that starts with listening um, and understanding what our needs might be versus what you can do. And, and that also adds to what Yuri was answering before in terms of 95% re you know, retention. It's not because we are the best at marketplaces. There's a lot of incredible marketplace accelerators, accelerators out there. There's a lot of amazing brand creative. I don't believe it's what you do. I believe it's how you do it. And that is really what breaks through and that keeps people coming back to you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you, I, I agree with everything Chris said. So we, in terms of what potential for Ukraine is, we always looking for new companies to buy. For instance, we're looking for a company that has Shopify experience and Shopify implementation. And I know Ukraine has a lot of great technology uh, uh, players. We're always looking for great creative talent. We have an internship program that's open around the world. So uh, from the opportunity standpoint, whether it's front row, anybody else, as I said, the world is is much more global than it's ever been. So you guys are, you have a lot ahead of you. So if, if, if there is someone who are willing to cooperate with you, just write Christopher and uh, Yuri on LinkedIn and say that. Absolutely. Yeah. You you met you met them on our I UK talks and uh, yeah. if you mentioned this UK talks and you mentioned Ruslan then we will accept the invitation. <laughs> Yuri Christopher, thank you very much. Actually, we we need to let you go a little bit early, and I would love to say a huge one more times thank you um, to Yuri Boykiv and Christopher Skinner, and to all our students and friends for joining us today at this inspirational conversation. And thank you for your time, energy, ideas, and it was really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. And I just want to say thank you guys for everything you're doing for the world. I know Ukraine is in a difficult situation and uh, I'm very proud of, of my country and what you guys are doing. I think people in the US really support you no matter what the government sometimes, this functional government is doing uh, um, here in the US, but generally it's it's incredible to see your struggles and to your fight for democracy. It means a lot. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you.